to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is our science expert and Forbes 30 under 30 education luminary, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Howdy. What is your favorite shirt? It can be anything that you put on the top oh. half of your body. It doesn't have to be Great a shirt question. shirt. It could be a hoodie. It could be a, mm. a jacket. Well, no, not a jacket. A jacket is not allowed. I'm drawing the line of jackets. Oh, <laughs> immediately I thought of a jacket. Um, <laughs> I know. Jackets are too easy. <laughs> a good jacket. Easy, mm-hmm. easy yeah. to latch on to and keep for many, many years of your yeah. life. And you have an excuse to wear it every day. Like no one's going to be like. Oh, you're wearing that jacket again. But yeah. if you wear your favorite shirt too many times, people will be like, what's going on with you? Catherine bud? recently hit me with the hoodie. She was like, that's too many days for that hoodie. And I was like, it's a hoodie. And she was like, no, that's it's been it's been 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a big favorite shirt guy. I have a, I go through favorite shirts and then wear yeah. them until they disintegrate off of my body. Mm-hmm. So I've been through many right now. I have a shirt that has probably I've worn it on the show before. It has little fish on it. Love my little fish shirt. When I was in middle school, I had a shirt that was from Banana Republic, uh, which looking (laughs) back is a very weird name for a store. And uh, (laughs) and it it had on it a dog, like a hunting dog and a hunting cap. And it was just like randomly arranged. Like there was the dog and then there was the hat and the hat was not like in proportion to the dog. And I liked this shirt and someone made fun of it for some reason. I don't remember why. But it made me so sad. And then I found it years later. I had stuffed it behind the hamper. Oh, Hank. Oh, no. Poor little Hank. I don't even remember doing it, but I remember finding it. You blocked it out. It was, oh, God, our little house. It had like, it had this one room that was the hall, but it was just a room and it had Like it had a door that you could close. I think it was maybe for like hurricane safety and it was the Uh darkest room in the house, but it opened onto every bedroom in the house. And then the hamper was in there. And that's where the, that's where the shame shirt lived. Where you stuffed the shirt. How long was it back there for years? Years. Nobody ever moved to the dang hamper. (laughs) What's going (laughs) on with that? Mom here. We (laughs) didn't clean behind the hamper for years. Dusty, dusty hamper. My favorite shirt ever. I had a shirt where it was Marvin the Martian and he was at Area 51 when I was a kid. I loved that one. I had a lot of great Looney Tune shirts back in the (laughs) days of the Warner Brothers studio catalog, you know? Mm -hmm. Great times. Yeah, no, I don't, but okay. (laughs) Okay, well... (laughs) That was like my childhood shirts too. A lot of whatever cartoon or comic or whatever I was into at any given time became mm-hmm. my new favorite shirt. Do you have Pokemon shirts? I had Pokemon shirts. I had a really good like Snoopy shirt. Oh, okay. I had a really like whatever video game I was into. I, if we went to like a Comic Con or a PAX or something, I would like save up my money and get one shirt with some video game reference that I thought was nerdy and funny and good. I think I saved up for like a a Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney shirt. I was just like them yelling objection. I was like, (laughs) this is is the best design ever. And like, what a niche interest. No one else will know what it is. Or if they do, I know they're a real one. I bet you had lots of friends (laughs) in school is what it sounds like, Sari. Well, as we've talked about (laughs) on the podcast, I certainly did (laughs) not. (laughs) I was a late bloomer and now I have friends. (laughs) Children can be so cruel. <laughs> Every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one up, amaze, and delight each other with science topics while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sam. A long time ago, an ancient fellow sat on a cactus and let out a bellow. Mm. He said to himself, this I cannot abide, and invented pants to protect his backside. <laughs> wow. Is this true? Maybe not. Heck, who can say? But pants are something we wear to this day. And while that first <laughs> pair was probably made out of skin, we've invented lots of things to make pants of since then. From denim to silk, from burlap to satin, there's a whole world of textiles that can cover your wagon. And along the way, you'll never guess what, we found textiles can do more than just hide your butt. Like be used as a sack to lug around corn, or as a soft blanket draped over a newborn. So if you're glad you don't spend all live long day nude, give it up for textiles and that one pants inventing dude. 
the topic for the today <laughs> is textiles, which I'm gonna guess isn't too hard to define. Also, I think that leather doesn't count. Well, the first pair of pants had to be made of leather. Then we improvised. Right. From then, there. We, then we went to textiles. Yes, created from fibers. Is that maybe like fibers woven together somehow? Sarah's done a bunch of work on this. We should let. <laughs> <laughs> no, speculate. It's more fun <laughs> if you just guess. We are going to take a quick break and then we will be back to figure out what the heck is a textile. Sari, I have a feeling that textiles are not going to be super hard to do. Like, oftentimes it's impossible, but this seems this seems possible to me. So Sam said that leather was the first pants, but that's not a textile, right? I don't uh, think so, but... I bet you I could turn what... leather into a textile if you chopped yes. it up real small. You'd have to weave with it. Yeah. I think the textile is when you take something very long and you make it into something flat. And the long thing is a fiber. Well, it could, yeah, but like it could be any long thing. It can be it any could, long. Yeah, it can be yeah. like a plant. It can it be an animal be... hair. Oh, like a hair. Like a wool, uh-huh. Uh-huh. right? Yeah. Uh, it can be threads. It can just be like extruded plastic, which a lot it of clothes be... are now. Uh huh. It can be metal. Metal filaments oh. are a thing. It can oh, be carbon yeah. fiber. It... Wait a second. Is chain mail a textile? I think chain mail is a textile. I think <gasps> it's like cow. anything that is made from any sort of fiber. Could I do it with the burrito? Mm. Could I just slice a burrito very stretch. thin? <laughs> Weave it together. Then, like I think I could. I think you yeah. could. Not a burrito. A, a, a tortilla. A tortilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if you if you like lay out the t- tortilla and you roll it up, it's very like a taquito, but yeah, thinner. Yeah, really smoosh it up together. <laughs> and then you like lay it like Lincoln logs. That's almost mm-hmm. weaving, I think. So yeah. a textile is the product of weaving. Weaving or non-woven fabrics. Because like felt. Oh, there's non-woven fabrics. Felt. Felt mm-hmm. is non-woven. Felt. And a lot of what we think about are pants or shirts or or clothing. So what? Yeah. Yes. If I braid my hair, am I making a textile? It's a great question. Yeah. I Boom. Bet you are. It is weird. <laughs> it I is found weird. the way that it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's not a it's not a textile until I cut it off. So if it's attached to my head still, that's just a hairstyle. That's a coward's thinking, Hank. But if I cut it <laughs> if I cut it off, then then it's a textile. You could grow yourself your own hat. <laughs> Living hat. We, I do grow myself my own hat. It's well, just, it sits there be, all, the, all the time. It'd be more formally recognizable as a hat. Textile art comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. It does. Once yep. you weave it into a, a textile, then you can make whatever you want, want, I guess. The sky's yeah. the limit. I have woven. Do you weave? I have in the past. I've, I have I was like a, a hobby amazing. kid, you know, where oh, you go yeah. to the dollar store and you find those craft kits that's like... Yeah, you're a hobby kid's kid. Kid's first plume. I feel like there's like a <laughs> like a above 80% chance that Sari can do like a more than one yo-yo trick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> With more than one type of yo-yo too, I got into like normal yo-yoing, <laughs> and I got into like uh, I don't know if it has a better name, but Chinese yo-yoing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have yeah, no yeah, idea yeah. what that the is. Sticks, the, st- the sticks yeah. and the big. Oh yeah, With yeah, yeah. Ball, okay. The thing you have- that is exactly uh-huh. the kind of kid I was. Yeah. Wow. Did you have Dumbled devil sticks? Where you have two sticks and then the yeah. third stick uh, on it. Yeah. <laughs> and you do like throwing. You did kicks. that? You did oh, that too? 100%. Sam. <laughs> Think of a hobby. You're a deeply strange person. I had, <laughs> oh, man, I had this all is this a, time on the my The fact hands. that Sari's turned out okay is great news for my <laughs> yeah. son, who is, who is a hobby kid who does not have any interest in friends. <laughs> do you weave, Sam? I just bought all the stuff to do hobbies and never actually tried to do them. So, <laughs> no, I don't weave. I took like a sewing class in middle school. My mom's quite an accomplished quilter, but I never really oh. fell into the fiber arts. Yeah. Sari, I have yes. another thought. Is a basket <laughs> a textile? Another rose. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, I would say so. It's as much a plant fabric. As, like if you look at rayon or any of those bamboo right. pants or whatever, that's just... 
uh, you take the wood pulp and yeah. you process it a bunch. But if you took bamboo and wove it into something, I would say that's right. Still and if I just like stretched a, a, a like a fabric over a frame and in, into a basket shape, that would also be a basket. It would <laughs> yes. also have yeah. it would also have a textile. So like, <laughs> it's a basket component of the basket, and then a textile component of the basket. Mm-hmm. This word sounds like a word textile that somebody invented in like the 1900s yeah, to call a sure. factory that or something. Mm-hmm. Or before that, uh, okay. it's like the 1600s okay. sort of right, is when sure. it started being a, a real thing. But but the root word is Latin, uh, textilis, oh, which okay. means woven or uh, from the word textere, which means to weave or to fabricate. So I think it meant cloth probably or something or baskets or whatnot but was more general it seems like Mm -hmm. um because the the word text like a book text also Uh comes from the same root word of Uh, textere because we Um, we we, we, how do we weave the words is that it is paper a textile could be yes it was sometimes it's not paper but like we used to write on on textiles yeah Mm -hmm. yeah but the words are kind of like joined or fit together and so mm. that is that is your text. I bet that's got a religious oh. piece to it. Would be my guess. Mm-hmm. From medieval medieval Latin. So if you go slightly closer to our time, textus mm-hmm. meant the scriptures in addition to like a text oh. or a treatise. So yes, it is is a little religious. I looked up the word fabric just because I was curious, and it was originally used to mean any sort of like like anything fabricated, so metal, stone, wood, oh, etc. Yeah, that, that, that's just that, any I, I never thought about fabricate and fabric, obviously yeah. related words. And then in the 1700s, I think starting around 1753 is one of the earliest uses. It meant like a textile fabric or something hmm. woven huh. in addition to that. They needed a new word because textiles is a deeply boring word. And fabric is a much nicer word for what it is, I think. Fabric sounds so cozy and textile mm. sounds so hard. Cold. Yeah, yeah. Cold. that's right. And yeah. there are some textiles, and that's that's like the difference between them. I think all fabrics are textiles, but not all textiles are fabric because, like, if if you have chain mail, that's not a fabric. Oh. Oh, it's hard. Gotcha. It hard. It is hard and cold. Or if you have, I don't know, <laughs> there's like geotextiles, which are the stuff that around sandbags or beneath, um, like landfills or things like that. Like gotcha. those are textiles, oh, wow. but they aren't necessarily fabric. Yeah, I wouldn't want to wear one. No, we don't want to wear garbage, the landfill garbage liner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would keep me warm. I'll say that. <laughs> All right. I feel informed on what a textile is. And now it's time to move on to this so the quiz portion of our show, where this week we're going to be playing a little game of True or Fail Textiles. Textiles play an essential role in our lives, shaping just about every aspect of our day through the clothes that we wear and etc. So the manufacture and trade of textiles has played an important role in shaping the economy of many countries throughout history. So today, we're going to be playing a game of Truth or Fail Express Textiles Edition. I'm going to be presenting you with a story about textile regulation, and it's up to you to decide whether it is mm. true or false. It is so hard to remember how important clothes are and how rare it is that they are this easy to get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we're going to learn about that right now. Fact number one. Tariffs are taxes that have to be paid for different products that are being imported and exported into and out of a country. And as U.S. manufacturing increasingly goes overseas, many of those products are subjected to a tariff when they are imported to the U.S. To reduce the tariffs on shoes, some U.S. companies will add a thin bit of fabric to the sole because shoes with fabric soles are subject to a lower tariff than shoes with a rubber sole. Is this true or false? Uh, I mean, it sounds just evil enough to be <laughs> a thing that people do, huh? But no, I don't think it's true because because uh, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense to have the thin layer, and then someone have to cut it off or something. I don't know. It doesn't seem. I guess it doesn't seem like practical to me. It does not seem practical, but it seems just dumb enough to make it into law because rubber as a material may have been like rarer at one point. And so it's Uh like, oh, if it's just a fabric shoe, it's a ballet slipper, it's cheaper. So I think it's true. It is true. In fact, the New York Times published a news article about Columbia Sportswear and the use of this process called tariff engineering, where garment designs are modified in very small ways. (laughs) 
<laughs> to shift the classification of the product into a cheaper tariff. The company has designers work with trade experts to help them make these decisions. One of the examples was a boot or shoe that might have a very thin layer of fabric added to it because it will reduce the tariff uh, from the 37% taxed on rubber soles to the 12% taxed on fabric soles. The fabric is supposed to wear off super quickly so that customers just end up with the rubber sole. What have we built? What society have we built? What a massive waste of time for everyone involved. (laughs) I know. I I remember reading about like a, uh, like shirts that are like scrubs are, are classified differently for tariffs than regular shirts. Mm -hmm. But the way that they classify them as scrubs is that they have a certain pocket at a certain height low to the waist and so people just started making shirts with like low pockets you know business must move on and forward yeah nothing can stop it now i'm gonna be a little conspiracy theorist when it comes to clothing it's like oh my shirt's got a weird pocket it must be classified under a different tariff huh you should i mean every time that anything looks a little bit weird about a shirt it's probably because somebody's trying to save money somewhere trying to make some make a buck all right thing number two In the 13th century, the Flemish cloth industry was immensely successful, which led to an unfortunate rise in others producing their own counterfeit Flemish textiles. To counteract this fraud, Flemish spinners developed a fiber (laughs) for weavers to integrate into their products to market as theirs. The fiber would dissolve in water, allowing it to be removed after the textile was sold. Is that true or false? Huh? So like it was visible until you like dipped it in water or something or. Yeah. So it was like in the textile. And then when you they people would buy it and be like, yes, I can see. But like it wouldn't affect the overall long term uh, look of the of the a Flemish fabric. original. Uh, sure. I went. I, it, this seems like very similar to the last one, which means maybe that it's true. I'm just going to go with true this time. I should have trusted myself last time. I think this one this one seems fake just because there's water too many places. People are oh, sweaty. Shoot. You're going to sneeze on You're this right. shirt. I'm such, and... I'm such an idiot. Well, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's meant to last a long time. Uh, yeah, it's not meant to last a long time. It's got to make it a little bit far. you got to make mm. it to the point of sale. And... So we spill a cup of water on the pile of shirts. Yeah, you don't you don't walk around with your open water bottle as you're browsing <laughs> Banana Republic and yeah, like Flemish <laughs> Flemish and your Flem- clothing. 13th century Flemish market. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Well, it is in fact false. Congratulations, yeah. Sarah. You're running away with it. Uh, it is inspired by two things, though. The first is the fact that apparently saris made from Mysore silk are given a ID number that is embroidered into that sari, so you know where it is and. Uh, and and where it comes from. The second is a recent project developing a fiber to serve as like a barcode on fabrics that can help identify the contents of the fabric. Because it's important to be able to identify the contents of a fabric for recycling purposes. Oh, but that can sure. be difficult when labels are usually worn out or removed and techniques to study the fabric chemically might not be able to identify the exact blend of the fabric. So hmm. you can actually like somehow weave into the fabric an identifiable way of saying like what exactly this fabric is made of, which hmm. is wildly complex now. All right, last thing, last chance to come back, Sam, is story number three. To encourage the growth of its own industries in the 17th century, England wanted to find a way to get its citizens to buy wool in place of other fabrics, particularly linen that was imported from France. So Parliament passed the Wool Acts of 1667 and 1677, which stated that people had to be buried in a wool shroud in place of other (laughs) fabrics, and that failure to comply would result in a fine of five pounds. Anything to stick it to the French, I bet they would do. <laughs> so I'm going with true. Even Why the not? dead, even yeah. dead English people have to stick it to the French. That's I right. could also see them having too many sheep and being like, ah, oh, freaking hell, we like <laughs> sent yeah. all the people to Australia and now they're sending us wool. Like we've colonized too much. We have too many sheep all around the world. And now we need to tr- trick our to people. Bury into- some wool. Yeah. Bury some wool. Yeah, put it somewhere. <laughs> we need more single use wool. <laughs> So, yeah, I think it's true also. All right. Well, it is true there. They did. They did do this. The act, and I have a quote from it, said, no corpse of any person, except those who shall die of the plague, shall be buried in any shift, sheet or shroud or anything whatsoever made or or mingled with flax, hemp, silk, hair, gold or silver or in any stuff or thing other than what is made (laughs) of sheep's wool only. 
<laughs> Somebody at the end uh, there was like they we were like making a list and then they're like just put in any uh, anything. Yeah. Stuff or thing. Yeah. Any stuff yeah, or yeah. thing. <laughs> That's like you go to your friends to be like, okay, name all the things you would wrap a dead person in. And yeah. then they're like, I can't think of any more. Well, well what about put stuff? in stuff or yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a surprise to me that in 1677 they used the word stuff like stuff. that. Stuff feels much more modern to me. It seems well, like we we just now realized that like we could have stuff. It's a vital word. You gotta yeah. have stuff. What else are you supposed to say? Things. Right. I guess you could say things. Do you think it maybe was stuff in like fluffy things? Like a like how maybe. Winnie the Pooh is full of stuff and fluff. So I don't know. Easy. I can't DM them. They don't have Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all buried in woolen sacks. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to do a tangents episode about stuff so you could tell us, you know, where yeah. it came from. Where stuff came from. Yeah, like, we could stuff. also do some necromancy and like ask them, be like, what did you mean by stuff here? <laughs> so the exception for people who died of the plague yeah, was apparently about? because they were concerned that the wool might stay infected for three to four years. And now I'm thinking that you like, would well, get take back. the wool back, which I don't feel like is what happens. Um, linen was the common shroud of choice for both traditional reasons and because linen was accessible to the poor and to the rich, but the government wanted people to buy more wool and the shroud ruling was one way to make that happen. Uh, we don't know how it went, really, but the law was repealed in 1814, probably because England's economy was not super wool reliant by then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Sari got all of those right. Good Sam job, got just Sari. one. We're going to take mm-hmm. a quick break, then we'll be t- back for the fact off. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the fact off. Our panelists have all brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them. I will award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, here's a trivia question. Sumptuary laws are laws designed to regulate consumption, including people's clothing. And in England, one such law was passed with the goal of trying to protect the cap industry. (laughs) The Cappers Mm. Act, this is real, of 1571 required males above a certain age, except for nobles, to wear a woolen cap on Sundays and holidays. Oh my God, they were obsessed with this stuff. The wool. Yeah. (laughs) Once again, 300 years in the past. Everyone's so toasty and itchy. It's just like a guy who was friends with the king. He was like, (laughs) buddy, I want to make some money today. (laughs) What was the age above which males were required to wear a woolen cap? What is an appropriate age for a fella to start wearing a cap? No, for a fella to be forced to wear a cap. Okay. At what point? <laughs> yeah. Can you force a, a two year old to wear a cap? To no, wear a probably not. Like, no, just, even just on Sundays. Come on. You Unfeasible. can't find a two year old. Yeah, I suppose who's young enough for them to have said, you're yeah. you're in financial trouble now, young man? I would say it's probably pretty young, like t- 12. That's the range I was thinking, too. Like a. Yeah little newspaper boy yeah uh you gotta wear a wool cap and you're you are only nine years old the answer it's six they that's too little six year olds wear that's caps. too little to bully and find a, a, a no, somebody no the king can do whatever the king wants to do <laughs> yeah uh the the act was however repealed in 1597 so it was only around for a for a couple dozen years but you know, there was a lot of good caps at the time, <laughs> apparently. Um, by the time this law was repealed, hats were had been sort of forced to be so in style that they didn't really even need it anymore. Oh, everybody just loved hats. It worked. It worked. They did it. The fashion changed. They tricked people into liking hats. <laughs> I love how they just like left out the nobles. They were like, you guys who have lots of money don't have to buy the extra thing. You got you crazy kids are buying all kinds of hats, probably. Yeah. You're not the yeah. problem. You don't wear it. You probably, your hat's probably from France. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> boo, boo. Boo, boo. All right. That means Sarah gets to go first. So one of my much repeated takeaways from studying biology is that it is a freaking miracle that anything in our bodies works because there are so many ways for things to go wrong. Yeah. Uh, for example, 
in developing human fetuses, there's a hole in the heart called the ductus arteriosus that connects the pulmonary artery, which typically carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs, with the aorta, which typically carries oxygenated blood from the heart to the rest of the body. That's like one of the main places you wouldn't want to have a hole. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't want those bloodstreams Mm. to mix in our adult bodies uh, because those are very different types of blood. Uh, But this opening is a normal part of development because a fetus's lungs are not breathing air yet. Um, They are filled with amniotic fluid and the fetus gets oxygenated blood along with nutrients and other important life things through the umbilical cord from the placenta. So in many cases, this hole closes up after the baby is born and it's no longer fluid filled lungs start doing their thing. But sometimes it doesn't close and Mm -hmm. babies are left with what's called patent ductus arteriosus or PDA which is one of several kinds of holes that are considered congenital heart defects. And it turns out that these sorts of unclosed heart holes are more prevalent in children who are born at high altitudes, uh, possibly because of the lower atmospheric pressure and lower concentration or saturation of oxygen molecules in each breath. Plus, the shapes or sizes of these high altitude congenital heart defects can't always be fixed by the commercially available medical devices out there which generally are permanent implants that are designed to be inserted with a cardiac catheter and then expand to fill the gap. They are a woven wire mesh. So I've gotten to the point. They're Uh textile. My fact is on topic. There's just a lot of biology context first. And you can look them up. They're generally called PDA or ASD or duct occluders, which are fancy names for these like wiry structures. And coupled with that difficulty, different high altitude places have different access to medical technology supply chains and financial resources and trust in various procedures. So a doctor named Franz Freudenthal, who lives in La Paz, Bolivia, which is around 12,000 feet or 4,000 meters above sea level. Um, He's a pediatric cardiologist who often treats indigenous Aymara children with these kinds Mm. of heart defects. And he published a paper in 2018 about how he worked as part of a team of doctors, biomedical engineers, and Aymara weavers to co-create a new device to fill these heart holes. Uh So specifically, they settled on a traditional textile design called the Andean Cross or Chicano weaving pattern. And the device is woven from a single strand of nickel titanium alloy called Nitinol by Aymara Craftswomen. Uh, The paper says they undergo about four months of training to learn the exact device specs. And then they weave on a circular mold instead of a big flat loom. And small devices take around three hours to weave, but larger devices can take like around a day and a half. And the researchers also say that this specific pattern is too complex for current machines to replicate. And so far, these devices have uh, successfully passed regulation and have been used to seal up congenital heart defects in children and adults in these like high altitude South American places. Um, And the paper also calls out the cultural significance of having these like handmade medical devices and combining traditional textile skills with modern medicine, which is like very lovely to think about. These people get to carry that that blend of science and art with them quite literally like in their hearts. Sarah, that is so cool. Thanks. I really came right. I've been slacking this season. I've been so sad this season. I've been losing. Uh, I came in with a banger this episode. I'm so proud of finding this fact that too. Is so cool. That's that's got everything. It's like New York's hottest club. Yeah. It's got duck decluders. It's got babies with holes in their hearts. It's got high altitude <laughs> Andean mountains. It's got it's got indigenous craftswomen. It's got nickel titanium alloys. It's got everything. And no one's talking about it. There's like this guy did a TED talk in 2016 and there's like one or two articles since then. But it's like the paper was published. It's like a miracle that I found this. The Internet offered it up to me in my (laughs) manic Googling uh, and was like, please share this story on your podcast because no one else. Wild. What like what a what a thing to like uh be both like conscious of like the need to be you know like who are you going to trust like this random person from out of nowhere but also to be conscious of like how like you know how, like can can we use the like abilities of this community that, that we don't have to help mm-hmm. uh like solve two problems at once working with the people you're trying to help it's the mm-hmm. it's the way to do things it's the way to do things well, Sam, what's the thing that's going to not <laughs> change your fate? Well, I don't know. You don't know. I don't. You're right. Space travel. 
It's one of the pinnacles of science, technology, and the indomitable human spirit. Exploring space can offer us insight into the very origins of our universe and humanity's role in it. Space travel is also, on a practical level, pretty disgusting. uh, Because astronauts are up in the space station, they're crammed in a tin can with a bunch of other sweaty nerds. Everything's floating around. (laughs) Bodily fluids are floating around. Your ass is floating around when you're trying to take a crap in the toilet. There's mold. There's dust. There's grime. We've covered a lot of this on previous episodes of SciShow Tangents, by the way. Explore the back catalog, everyone, won't you? (laughs) But there's one indignity of space exploration that we haven't really talked about on Tangents and that which I've never really thought about before. And it's the fact that astronauts can't wash their dirty undies. And that makes sense. Mm. So first of all, I feel like a spin cycle on a space station probably is a bad idea. It doesn't seem like it would work. But also... Yeah, it would. You think so? Yeah. You don't think my my washing machine always goes like this. Yeah, yeah. You if that started that. happening on the space station, you're in trouble. It's true. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've... That's how gravity. That movie Gravity happened. <laughs> <laughs> but also, <laughs> but also, water is really heavy, so space agencies try to launch only as much as their astronauts will need sure. for yeah. like drinking and stuff. Mm-hmm. But you know, it isn't heavy. Standard issue, astronaut underwear. So instead of washing anything, astronauts are sent up with all the socks and the shirts and the pants and the underwear that they'll need for the duration of their stay. They wear them until they're too gross to wear them anymore, which seems to be about a week, according to a NASA press release, and then shoot them off to burn up in Earth's atmosphere along with like all the rest of their garbage. Man, that was like, that's basically how I did it in college. (laughs) Yeah, right? (laughs) And that said, there's a certain freedom into shooting your dirty laundry into space. That sounds great. (laughs) Uh, But the idea is that someday astronauts will be establishing permanent bases on the moon and beyond. So throwing away all your dirty laundry, it's not really going to work in the long term. Plus, while everybody has their own personal underwear, spacesuits have a sort of communal pair of high tech long johns that go on over your astronaut diaper. When you go out for a spacewalk, everybody's got to share this one pair of long johns. And that can get both very nasty and can't be shot into space. It's important. So finding a way to eke out any semblance of hygiene is paramount to astronauts. So one way that various space agencies are trying to fight the plight of crusty undies is by developing new fabrics to make them out of, of course. In 2009, astronaut Koichi Wakata was sent up to the ISS with experimental antibacterial underwear that he could wear for a month at a time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and all the articles. He, so chose. he did and he did choose he also said that he didn't tell anybody that he was doing it like they that's, gave him like a secret yeah. mission almost <laughs> or, like, where at least for a long time yeah, that's like he definitely no. told other people it's like it's a secret so no, sorry yeah. they, they're not just always asking each other about their underwear up there <laughs> <laughs> i mean they might be they're finding a lot to talk about all the articles that i could find about this said that the used underwear were currently being studied to gauge their effectiveness but i never found any follow-up about that at all so uh i can assume that they either didn't work at all to a catastrophic degree or they worked so well that it was boring and nobody wanted to write about it i mean how do you test yes because i know how i test you scrape it you put (laughs) it in the machine you give it a little sniff a little sniff uh so then more recently In 2021, the ESA teamed up with the Vienna Textile Lab to make a textile with microorganisms integrated right into it that create antimicrobial, antiviral, and antifungal compounds to get rid of other, more stink-causing microorganisms. (laughs) But that still seems to be undergoing testing to see if it can, like, survive in space. But I will Mm -hmm. point out that there are things that can dirty your underwear that aren't just microbes. So I I feel like, you know, you're not going to do anything about the streakies or whatever. And finally, NASA's just trying to build a washer dryer unit that can be sent to the moon to do laundry. But since everything in space needs to be a little bit disgusting, they also need to develop a water treatment system that would be able to make the detergent and grime filled laundry water drinkable again. Uh, So after hearing all of that, learning all of this, my solution to the problem is this naked astronauts. (laughs) I mean, somebody's had to have thought of it by now, right? It seems very logical that you'd just be floating around up there naked to be. Uh, as long as you can make I make sure everybody smells okay. Sometimes I think that the, the clothes provide that service. Yeah, maybe you're right. Keeping maybe the inside right. smells inside a little bit. Yeah. Do the inside smells float out of you because there's no gravity, though, anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that that affects it, but I am (laughs) convinced that a spin cycle on a space station is a bad idea. At first I was like, what? Ah, That's fine. 
But you'd really have to balance that centrifuge mm-hmm. because you don't want a bunch of jiggles. And my yeah. washer and dryer, if that's anything to go off of, I'd be dead in Just space for sure. Over the place. Yep. Gosh, stinky underpants or the best fact <laughs> ever. <laughs> that's fine. Who I did a bad fact on purpose this week so Sarah could win. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, you threw <laughs> <awesome>. yeah. <laughs> congratulations Sari, on on taking this one home handily i'm Thank gonna go ahead and send 500 hank bucks right your way Wait, wow you never i'm rich. Send me I'm rich. anything i never get nothing when i win all the I time i forget that they exist okay <laughs> and now it's time for ask the science couch where we ask a listener question to our virtual couch of finely honed scientific minds hail on discord and at mars tina on twitter ask why can't machines crochet? We've been making knitting machines for hundreds of years. Boy, you definitely <laughs> found an area that I I could never pull this one out of my hat. Like that's <laughs> I got nothing. What you didn't do knitting or crocheting as your type of textile making? No, well knitting, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I I. I think that like, first of all, sewing machines, I don't even, I don't really understand how they work. And I know that they are very weird and complicated Mm -hmm. because it doesn't like pass the needle through over and over again. It like, it like goes through and then it like pushes something through and then it pulls it up and then it goes through again and then it pushes. So it's, it's, it's different from like, you know, like a normal, whatever that's called. I forgot the name of the stitch or something, but like the stitch where you just go in and out. Well, I'll do my best. I've knit. I've also knit before. I've not crocheted before. So a knitting machine is different than a sewing machine and crocheting yes, machines for sure. don't exist. Interesting. Um, <laughs> that's awesome and yeah. weird. So, so sewing, you are taking a thread and you have fabric. So you have a textile already and then you're kind of like jo- joining things together with knitting yeah. and crocheting. You are making a fabric. You are making yeah. a fabric through like taking a thread like, like yarn and weaving it or knotting it to itself Mm -hmm. yeah and i've seen like knitting machines Mm -hmm. uh like knit sweaters are obviously made by machines yeah sure and i've seen the like machines that make socks um, yeah which are also knitting machines but i did not know that you could not make a crochet machine yeah and it's because of the difference between the way that you like weave the yarn in and loop it in in itself in knitting Hmm. and crocheting so the way that knitting works, and the problem is, is this is like a very visual thing, and yeah. I don't know enough about textiles, but I'll try my best, and then mm-hmm. hopefully people will either understand or look it up in our sources, because I included some people <laughs> who talk about it better than I do. So, so knit fabric is basically formed by pulling yarn through a row of previous existing loops. And knit fabric, if you look at it really closely... You, you see pretty regular like rows and columns of stitches. So in those like hand crank knitting machines, they're a circle or something or a straight line and you, you go row by row and you, and you create more fabric. And so there's always an, uh, like a closed end of it where it won't unravel from. And then there's an open end where all those loops on that end, um, if you like dropped the string from it, it'll unravel pretty quickly. And you can make patterns to some degree while knitting by adding loops in different ways. You can mm. remove loops. You can use cables to change the order of the loops, which makes those like crisscrossy patterns and those wool sweaters or something. But regardless of what you do, there's still going to be this like raw edge from which mm-hmm. like everything can unravel. Crocheting, on the other hand, is a different form of loop building that works with one needle, like one hook, as opposed to two needles. And you go one stitch at a time. So every time you make a loop, you close it off. And so whatever you can, whatever you're doing, even if you're like making a row of a bunch of loops, it'll unravel much slower than a, a knit project because you have to undo one knot at a time. And because you're working with one hook, there are also a bunch of different crochet stitches that you can do. So you can like pick up three loops and wrap around backwards. So you can wrap around forwards. Like you're manipulating the yarn with one hand and you're manipulating the hook with the other. And so while knitting is this like big row, you're doing basically the same thing. You're just making more loops upon more loops upon more loops. Crocheting, there are so many different hand movements and ways in which you can create more stitches and like the things that you can make with crochet 
can ha- hold more 3D shape because you can just decide to add loops, like one-off loops, hmm. more flexibly than with knitting. And that is much, much harder to program a machine to do. Like machines are so good at like repetitive processes. Um, so you can make knitting machines, but a crocheting machine is much harder. And it's not profitable to make a crocheting machine because if you want like a fancy border or a custom, like you want to make a an infinity scarf with cat ears on it or something, mm-hmm. you can use a knitting machine to make the scarf part or the hat really, really fast. And then for the custom like 3D parts, you can crochet those extra little bits by hand. Are you saying that it's it's it is possible? Depending on what kind of crochet stitches you use like there are some simpler i think Mm -hmm. i i've not again not crocheted but i think there's some simpler like chain stitching that would maybe be easier to to have a machine do regularly but like all of those like 3d stuffed plushies or anything those require so many different stitches that it would be really prohibitively expensive to program a machine to manipulate things in that way that's, I mean, you really don't want your machine to make a single mistake. So it makes sense. Like, that, like I, I feel like everything would just completely fall apart. Knitting, I guess, is just much simpler. But I will not understand until I crochet, I feel like, <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. Are I you think... still a hobby guy? Do you still ever pick up any new ones? Oh, my God, Sam. What do you think I do with, like, all of the time? <laughs> what do you think this is? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I guess I was really trying to gauge where... What level of what level of thing you consider a hobby? Yeah, no, I I became a stand up comedian for oh, a little I while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. If you want to ask the Science Couch your questions, you can follow us on Twitter and Threads at SciShow Tangents, where we will send out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Bucky's Revenge on YouTube, at JCYB on Twitter, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's super easy to do that. First, you can go and listen to five episodes. This <laughs> <laughs> You can also go to patreon.com slash scishow tangents to become a patron. If you're wondering about that, why we're saying that is because Apple changed some of the rules and so yeah, it's, we're behind on we're like busting all our beans. Which it's is why we our also beans. have extra advertising <laughs> impressions right now. It will go back to normal soon. You know what uh, JCYB yeah. stands for? No. Ja Country's Yes Bogert. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you stick around to the end, everybody. <laughs> you can join us on our ta- on our Patreon. You can get access to great stuff like our uh, our movie commentaries, which do exist. Some bonus episodes, which are very good. Shout out to Patron Les Acre for their support. For third, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show, and it helps other people find us. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell, tell people, people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Jess Stenberg. Our associate producer is Eve Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Blitzman. Our social media organizer is Julia buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Kibuki Trakavardi. Our sound design is by Joseph tuna Our executive producers are Nicole Sweeney and me, Hank Green. And of course, we could not make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Cellulose is a structural polymer in plants that comes in lots of different forms. For example, cellulose fibers from flax plants can be spun into linen, or fibers extracted from wood pulp can be processed into semi-synthetic rayon fabrics. And in 2016, the Dutch artist Jalia Essaidi decided to engineer fabric from the cellulose in dried cow manure. She showed off some dresses made of this poop-derived fabric in a fashion show, but it understandably has not taken off in the textile industry. Classic art student shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> you would know doing Stuff than like that. Yeah. I'm sure I saw multiple things made of poop when in my time at art school. <laughs>